if I'm looking, for example, at the archive or the problems that Dwight was talking about with the publishers, I think that most people are using something like PDF LaTeX uh, rather than ZTEC or anything else like that. So a lot of these problems don't arise. The second thing is um, I, I, I'm talking about the typesetting rather than the, than the rendering to screen or plate or PDF or whatever. And Don Knuth's tech, the typesetting depends only on the tech font metric. So one of the things I'm doing in my mind to keep everything small is to stick to Don Knuth's tech of 1982 and get things working there properly and then move on to catch up on the subsequent developments. I think that provides an easier route and I think it brings benefits f fairly early on and one of the biggest benefits is you can see everything working and so you can see the relationship between the parts and I think having multiple components working together is a great situation in terms of people developing each component individually in the context of the whole. So whilst these are important problems um, and that's something we have to be aware of and are grateful to be reminded of them. I don't see them as being fatal to the project. I see making, thing, making the archive work better, for example, or making publishing work better in core or STEM is already sufficient reason to deal with this. And as evidence for that, I go back to Overleaf. Overleaf doesn't solve all of these problems, but it solves them well enough to be a very useful tool. And I'm hoping to get the same benefits, but outside the warm embrace of Overleaf. Can I move on? Which is uh, download and upload. So instead of downloading a tech live distribution and installing it. You download, for example, all, all the styles you need and all the TFM files you need and all the uh, post type one and other PostScript fonts that you need and store them at some place in your machine and they become, so to speak, your backing store. So you are going to assume that the other person whom you're collaborating with has got the same access to obtain those resources from a shared download place, which would be somewhere like CTAN or Tech Live. And this is more or less what Tiny Tech does based upon Tech Live for the R markdown and typesetting R markdown documents. So the basic idea of the download is that for any particular resource that appears in any particular tech distribution that's, when I say resource, I'm particularly thinking of style file, any style file that's appeared in a tech distribution, you'll be able to say, here's the secure hash of it, now give me a copy. You want the universe well, to have that capability or sublime every, so to speak, latex style file that ever exists. When I say latex, I mean released on CTAN. And that shouldn't be a big deal because I think that all the style files that have ever appeared in Tech Live will occupy about six gigabytes or something when stored in a Git repository. They're not that big because there's a tremendous amount of duplication. It's just that when you try to expand it to give every single version of every single file, it becomes absolutely enormous. There's something called a Git bomb which is a very interesting concept. It's a Git repository that occupies perhaps 200K, less than a byte. But when you unpack it, it occupies because it has multiple copies of exactly the same file. So you have hello, 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 that's the file. And you have a folder that has got 100 files, all of which have got the same value. 
and then you've got another fault that's got the same stuff all over again. So you just go through powers of 10 and it's very quickly to get it to, to get this small Git repository. When you check it out, it consumes your whole disk and it's called a Git bomb. And every file and every version of every tech life distribution is similarly a Git bomb. And the solution to that is never check it out. Just read it file by file, but don't ever check it out as a whole. Um, once you understand that, you re realize that you don't need gigabytes of storage because you ha don't have gigabytes of data. The amount of data you've got is considerably less than gigabytes. And you can think of Git as being an extremely efficient and effective compression algorithm that not only compresses very well, but unpacks, but gives you very quick access to resources. The problem with most compression systems is that um, getting a bit of data in the middle is expensive. The same goes for encryption. Getting a bit of data in the middle is expensive. So the idea of the download is that you download all the stuff for Tech Live 2021. And then in 2022, you download the increment that you need. And for 2023, you download the increment you need. And at some point, you'll throw away stuff for the earlier years if you need to. But you, you, you're presuming that these things will be available forever. For some reason or another, they will be available effectively forever. So that's, that's the download side of it. And I've started doing experiments on that and they seem to be quite successful, certainly enough to make me encouraged about all of this. I'll stop so that I can take a breather and so that people can ask questions or make comments. Yeah. <laughs> One quick thing is, do you expect the internet to be there when you're typesetting or not? <laughs> I do not expect the internet to be there when I'm typesetting, but I do expect the internet to be there, perhaps via a sneaker net, when I'm installing software. And this is installing software. So when I'm typesetting, I'm expecting, you've got to remember that Git is a peer-to-peer -peer version control system. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. So once I've cloned a Git repository, I've as good as got my own copy of it. There's nothing special about my clone that gives it allegiance to the master. So I don't need the internet to be there. And if I'm a, in a high security environment, I, I ask for permission to install um, the following following git files and that's all I need. All I need is to have certain git, git pack files installed and everything will work. Just as uh, all I need to typeset is to connect to the internet, do the installation, do the downloads and then disconnect to the internet and throw away the network card and I can typeset. So I'm assuming that there's some software distribution mechanism that might be the internet, it might be the CD, it might be hard disk, it might be floppy disks. I'm just assuming that there's some distribution mechanism, but I'm not expecting the internet to be available when I'm typesetting. Another thing I think we have to remember here is that although we've talked about things like Tech Live 2021, that isn't a single thing. It, it isn't sites that install it once and wait until next year to put the next edition in. But many sites, including mine, uh, run updates multiple times a year. In my case, typically a, once a week or so on some machines more frequently so that I have the latest stuff. And essentially what this means then is that as a, this mechanism of identifying a file name and associating it with a checksum sort of has to be a dynamic process. And so if the user goes to typeset a document and include say article.sty and that's been replaced since the person did it last that is recognized and a fresh copy is made because the problem we have is that neither c10 nor the tech live archive have a revision history themselves packages simply get replaced by new versions um, and uh, the old ones really have disappeared so uh, the idea of the Git repository where things can be automatically propagated to peers is a good thing, but 
we have to recognize that this is an issue that we don't have a single fixed point for any of these tech distributions that we can rely on. Excellent. This uh, is an excellent comment, Nelson, and it takes me into my next topic. Uh, 